This is The Resilient Life, where we believe that every human will struggle in this life. Our challenge is to struggle well. I'm Ryan Mannion. I lost my brother to war, my mom to cancer, and I'm the daughter of a retired Marine. I'm also a wife, mom, author, and president of one of the nation's leading veteran service organizations. Join me and some incredible guests as we explore the value of struggling well through life's inevitable challenges. Welcome to another episode of the Resilient Life Podcast. Today's guest is Michael Easter, author of The Comfort Crisis. I was introduced to this book by a uh, kind of our regular podcast guest, Jason McCarthy, founder of Go Ruck. And Jason kept posting this. Uh, Go Ruck kept posting this. Everybody kept posting this book. And I'm like, I, I have to read this book. And um, now I know why. Uh, it's incredible. We're going to dive into it a lot more. But uh, Michael, welcome to The Resilient Life. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Happy to be here. So the comfort crisis, as you know, Again, Jason kind of introduced me to the concept and and I I you can kind of tell by the title what the book's about, right? Like and so I I kind of knew what we were going to be reading, but before we dive into some of the discoveries that you made in the book, I'd love to know what brought you to this place where you've dedicated so much of your life to this idea of comfort and the dangers of living within your comfort zone. Like when did you start studying this and how did you first dive into this topic? Yeah, so I, my, so my background is that I'm a health and science journalist and I have been my entire career. And um, I worked at Men's Health Magazine for a bunch of years. And when I was in that role, I basically saw that literally every single thing I wrote about that improved human health, it usually, you usually had to go through some form of discomfort right? To like get to the other side where you were improved. So if you wanted to improve your fitness, you were going to have to work out and working out sucks. It's uncomfortable, right? If you wanted to lose weight, you were probably going to have to be hungry and that's no fun. Even with your mental health, it's like, if you are going to tackle whatever's going on under the surface, you're probably going to have to ask some questions and have some things come up that you don't necessarily want to deal with. Um, so I saw that, observed that. And then I went through some things in my own life where for me to improve my life, I, I myself had to go through discomfort. So I, I had to get sober when I was like 28. I was like, definitely a person who, uh, I'm definitely a person who shouldn't drink. <laughs> Let's just say that. And, you know, for me, alcohol was really like a, a comfort blanket from life, right? It just made everything easier, easier to talk to people, easier to go to a party, uh, killed stress, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so getting off of it was super hard. And super uncomfortable, like physically, mentally, I had to like rewire my brain and like learn how to like relive life more or less. Um, but by doing that, literally everything improved. I mean, full stop across the board. Uh, so that kind of got me interested in this idea that like, if you want to improve your life, you're probably going to have to go through some discomfort. And then I ended up taking on a story for Men's Health Magazine where I went backcountry hunting with this dude named uh, Donnie Vincent, who's a um, really interesting character. And we were off the grid in Nevada for not even that long. It was like five days. But from that experience, it was, it was like, oh, I could see that we as humans have engineered our lives to be like so unbelievably comfortable now compared to how we used to live for basically all of time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Donnie, you know, is a central character in your book. And I, I, I feel like I need a, a visual picture of him because I have this image in my head of, of what he looks like. But you know, you, you go on this back uh, off the grid hunting trip with him in Nevada, which leads to an even bigger adventure in the Arctic. And you, you Donnie, and another uh, gentleman named William go out there. I mean, you are in like untouched land searching for herds of caribou. And so, you know, for the listeners, this book kind of follows this journey but also dives into a lot of things Michael was experiencing along this journey and then backs it up with like research from all sorts of 
doctors and world-renowned scientists on the kind of physical and mental manifestations that were happening along this trip. And I'll tell you, there were, there were, I mean, I feel like everyone stuck out for me, but when you open the book, you're on this tarmac and you're about to get on this, you know, tiny little plane. Um, and that's the first thing that's unnerving you more than what you're about to embark on, but like this tiny little plane. And I could relate to that so much. I talk a lot about, you know, I travel all the time. I hate flying. Like literally there's nothing I hate more than flying. And it was my mother-in-law actually the other day was like, gosh, where are you now? Are you, are you at home? And I said, I'm at home. And she goes, you know, I remember when you were 18 years old and I took you to Hawaii and I, you were blowing into a plastic bag or a, the throw up bag because you were hyperventilating. And she goes, and now I think about all the times you just fly every week. And, you know, and people have asked me like, how did you get over your fear of flying? And I'm like, I just kept flying. Like I, I literally had to tell myself like, there's nothing. And I still hate it. I'm not, I don't love flying, but I had to like condition my body and get over that ultimate sense of discomfort, which sometimes I may still have a slight little panic attack on a plane, but I know how to control it better now. But it was just that repetition. So you start off and you're like, I don't love flying. And then you have to get on this tiny little plane to get to your, your destination. And not only that, but your, your pilot had like just crashed uh, a plane and, and you're getting back on. It's like, oh, this is the pilot that just crashed the plane. But you land and the first thing you talk about is this like solitude where, you know, it's just, there's no cell service and it's just you and your thoughts. And that was something that really, really struck me because I understand this idea of kind of breaking out and like pushing yourselves to do things where you're uncomfortable. But that for me, like when I look back on the last 10 years and I've done a lot of things to kind of push myself out of my comfort zone and, and get comfortable with being uncomfortable. But my, I guess you can call it addiction to my cellular device and to that connection, like it scared me thinking about you sitting in like the snow waiting for the waiting for the plane to come back. I was like, I was scared for you because I was like, I don't know what I would do just sitting by myself for one, two or three hours without anything. And you go into this long discussion about boredom and the role that boredom plays in our life. And I'd love for you to kind of share um, I feel like I'm just going to, I I have to let you talk because this podcast is about hearing you, but I, there's so much I want to talk about in this book, but tell us a little bit about that and that experience and what that led to. And ultimately this idea of like, we've actually gotten rid of boredom in our lives. And that's a terrible thing, like terrible for society, for mental health. Um, so talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Okay. So we were, we were up there and we were hunting caribou. Now I think people who are unfamiliar with hunting think it's like this action packed thing. You're like moving through the woods all the time and just like seeing all these animals. Uh, it's not like that at all. So caribou are migrating, right? And so we're trying to catch them on this migration. So we'd sit on these hills hoping that they were going to like move through, right? Uh, but they weren't. So we would sit, sit like literally all day on these hills waiting for caribou to come through that weren't coming through. Now, I didn't have my cell phone, as you mentioned, but I also didn't bring like a book, a magazine, that sort of thing. I surely didn't have my computer, right? So all of a sudden I find myself in this like strange state that's unfamiliar to me and that's that I'm bored, right? And yeah. so uh, how do I deal with boredom? Uh, we sat around and we read all the labels on the food we packed in, right? So I can tell you now that a cliff bar has 250 calories, 10 grams of protein, 49 carbohydrates, six grams of fat. On, I mean, I can name that about all kinds of food you yeah. backpack with, basically. Uh, we read the, the tags on our uh, gear. We, I did more push-ups, I think, that few days than I did maybe like all of last year, right? Uh, I came up with a bunch of different story ideas for the magazines I write for. Came up with all my Christmas shopping lists for like the next three years, right? <laughs> and so 
I told you that to basically tell you this is that boredom is this evolutionary discomfort that we have. So when we're doing something and whatever we're doing, the return on our time invested has worn thin, like we're not getting a good return on it. Uh, this discomfort of boredom kicks in and it basically tells us go do something else. Okay. So if, if you imagine it's, you know, a million years ago and you and I are deciding we need to hunt because we don't have any food, uh, but no animals are coming through, like boredom would kick on and basically suggest, Hey, you know, go pick some potatoes or whatever it might be. But today, the way we deal with boredom is what do we do? We pull out our cell phone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have so many easy, effortless escapes for, from boredom, right? Had I had my cell phone up there, that's all I would have done the whole time because that's like the next easiest thing. And it's like this hyper stimulated thing. I mean, literally, people sit around being paid hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to come up with like the best way that they can capture your attention for as long as possible. Like, we don't have a chance against this kind of stuff. Um, but boredom can actually be beneficial. So I basically argue, I mean, you look at the data and people spend more than 12 hours a day engaged with digital media, right? So that's like cell phones, TV, computer, all this kind of stuff. Um, and that's basically killed boredom, I think. But when you look at um, boredom, it actually has a lot of benefits. So it can help with, it can help relieve um, anxiety and depression. And part of that is that you're just offsetting this thing that like is actually causing you to be, you know, depressed and anxious, uh, but it can also improve creativity. So they've done these really wacky, fun studies where they'll take one group of people and they'll put them in a room and they'll say, you know, do whatever you want. Um, people pull out their cell phones immediately. Then they'll take another group and they will bore the hell out of these people. And then they test them. They give them creativity tests. And the board group always comes up with more, more creative answers than the non-board group. It's because your mind has some time to wander, right? And like come up with weird ideas. This is why, pe this is why people have their best ideas in the shower, right? Because you're just like, you got nothing to do. Right. Um, and then finally, I mean, I think when you think about how humans have evolved over time, I mean, we had like two and a half million years without anything digital in our lives. And we paid attention to a lot of different things, right? And now this kind of stuff, 12 hours a day, that has basically become our lives. So the shift in how a human experiences life now is like so unbelievably profound. Like there's this, there's this William James quote I love that where he says, your life is essentially a collection of that which you were aware of, right? I mean, that's really what it is. Yeah. And so I'm not saying that these things, you know, all this stuff is bad, uh, but I am saying maybe 12 hours of it is bad, <laughs> right? Well, it's interesting because I kind of had this ex experiment going on in my house as I was reading this book and particularly this section. So my, um, I'm, I'm Catholic and, um, my seven-year-old, uh, gave up for Lent his, uh, phone. Now he doesn't have a phone where he calls people, but he has my old phone that's deactivated that he can play all his games on. And his routine is he comes home from school and he starts playing Roblox or Minecraft with his friends. And, you know, we, we as parents have gone from like, you got one hour a day to we're really busy. And the next thing you know, he's been sitting on it for four hours. Well, yeah. for, for Lent, we're going around. So for Lent, it, you know, in the Catholic faith, you're for 40 days leading up to Easter, you're supposed to, um, you know, sacrifice and get rid of something, take something out. And um, my oldest daughter got said, I'm not eating ice cream. And my, my son says, what if I give up my phone? And I mean, I was like, yeah, yeah, you think you can do that? And he goes, I, I think I can do it. I'm like, okay. So I took his phone and, and he said, well, what happens if I ask for my phone? I said, if you ask for your phone, I give it back. Like, I'm, I'm not, this is yours. Like, this is your sacrifice that you're doing. So if you ask for it back, I'm not, you're not being punished. If you ask for it back, I'm going to give it back. So it's on you to, to hold out for these 40 days. And this started um, a couple weeks ago, and the first three days were like brutal. Now, he wasn't asking for his phone, but he was walking around the house just 
repeating, I'm bored, I'm bored, dad, I'm bored, mom, I'm bored. Then he got on the TV and he was going on YouTube, watching other people play Minecraft. Like, and, and so that was what was stimulating him, just watching other people. And he's a kid that likes to play, but you know, I've never seen him dive in real deeply into like independent play. Well, he's got buckets and buckets of army guys. And over the course of the last 10 days, all of a sudden he found this like reignited love for his army guys and his tanks. And every day he comes home from school and there's a new display set up and he's leaving like piles like, mom, don't touch that. That's my battle scene for when I get home from school or leave that there for tomorrow. And I've been taking pictures because it's actually the, the creativity where he's lining up everybody that has a rifle behind everybody that's kneeling and, you know, the tanks are all color corded. It's something I've never seen from him before. And this was literally all taking place while I was reading this section and you had written, you know, um, you had written boredom is indeed dead. And I wrote Travis giving up the phone for Lent on board. Like it all made so much sense. So you know, I know there's been a ton of studies, but I saw it happen in my own house. And he has not even talked about his phone. He stopped watching the, you know, other people play video games on YouTube. He still at night will get on and watch TV. But, you know, he's like, give me a good movie to watch. And, you know, my husband will be like, put on Back to the Future. You know, we're trying to introduce him to all the, the, the classics, right? But it was it was wild to see that taking place and also be reading it and just saying like, I, I totally see it. Like I get it. And always knew that, you know, pulling them away was from the, the devices was a good thing, but to see that creativity bloom um, was pretty awesome. It was yeah, really cool. That's, to see. that's super cool. And I, and I think that that's almost like a metaphor for, this whole book and that, you know, what happened the first couple of days is he's like, I'm so bored. This sucks. Yeah. Right. It's, it's uncomfortable. But then what happened after that, like you get to the other side of that and there's something there that's probably more interesting and it's probably going to improve his life more in the long run. Right. And that's yeah. kind of how, that's kind of how everything works. So no, that's super cool. I love that. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of what you dive into in the beginning is um, you dive into this idea that and, and it's not a new concept, but you really explore um, the, the technology that's in front of our faces for way too many hours. Because, I, you know, you think about it just, I, I try to gauge like looking at my phone and I'm like, all right, how much screen time did I have today or this week? But you factor in the television and more importantly, the computer. Because I could be like, oh, I only had an hour of screen time today, but I was on yeah. my computer for eight hours. And you know, that in itself is the same exact thing, right? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I think the point I'm, yeah, you know, there's a ton out there about how we need to use our phones less and like you hear it uh, a million different ways. And I agree with that. But I think the message that I'm trying to put out is that what happens when people take an hour off their phone screen time is that they go, oh, this is boring. What do I do? And then they go on their computer or they watch Netflix. And it's like your brain, your brain really doesn't know the difference, right? It's still, it's the same thing. So what I'm advocating for is not less phone. It is more boredom. Like just do something that's not digital. It's going to, you're going to be bored for a minute, but that's going to lead you into more interesting places. And I wonder too, cause you said like, I didn't bring a book and that would have been the first, that would have been my first place to go. Like, okay, I, I'm not going to be able to have any use of, of technology out here in the Arctic. Like I'm packing up my bag with a ton of books, but you didn't bring any books. And I found that kind of interesting. Was that purposeful? Books are heavy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, books are heavy and we were carrying everything. I mean, I could have brought one, but it was also like, I'm just going to see what happens out there with like, without anything to lean on. Because when I had done the Nevada trip, it was, it was interesting because I similar phenomenon and that I was bored and it kind of led me to some interesting places, but that wasn't, that also wasn't as long. I'm yeah. like, man, let's see what happens after 30 days of just straight mind wandering, weird conversations with those guys, like just seeing where things take me. Yeah. You know? So let's talk a little bit to another concept that you talk about early on in the book. And, and I may be pronouncing it wrong. Is it Misogi? Misogi. Misogi. Okay. Yeah. So Misogi. So tell us what Misogi is. 
Yeah. So I meet this guy whose name is uh, Marcus Elliott and there's two things you need to know about him. And the first is that he's kind of a seeker. So he, you know, he used to go to Burning Man way back in the day when it was like that little thing with weirdos in the desert. And, you know, now it's just a big thing with weirdos in the desert. But, <laughs> um, he lived out of a VW van in college. He got himself through college by counting cards. So he's like out there. Yeah. Right. Uh, but he's also like, unbelievably, unbelievably brilliant. So he graduated from Harvard Medical School. He decides he doesn't want to be a doctor. He decides that he wants to revolutionize sports science. Okay. So that's, that's, a, that's like a grand pronouncement that is almost like arrogant, right? Uh, but he actually does it. So he owns this facility called P3 and they have contracts with the NBA, the NFL, all these other different places. And he's basically able to, um, quantify human performance and movement more or less. So he does all this like high tech stuff with like analyzing people's movement. And then he can say, Oh, you have a, you know, 60% chance of tearing an ACL this season, the way your knee caves in. So we're going to do X, Y, and Z to reduce that risk. Like it's really just like numbers, data figures, cutting edge stuff. Uh, but he also realizes that what improves people's performance can't always be measured right? There are certain intangibles out there that sort of just boost someone's potential. And so to get to those, he does this thing called Masogi. Basically, the idea is that once a year, you're going to go outside and you're going to do something really, really hard. There's two rules. Rule number one is that it's got to be really, really hard. He defines that by saying you should have a 50-50 shot of completing whatever it is you decide you're going to take on. And then rule number two is that you can't die. <laughs> and that is just sort of a tongue in cheek way of saying like, don't be an idiot about this, right? right? So him and his crew have done things like uh, one year they walked an 85 pound boulder uh, five miles underneath the Santa Barbara channel. So one guy goes down, picks it up underwater, walks it, you know, 10 yards, goes up the next guy and so on and so forth. Uh, but they've also done more straightforward ones. Like, you know, you can see a mountain in the distance. Like, let's see if we can get there in a day. Um, really again, though, it has to be, you have to think like, I don't know if we're actually going to be able to do this. Right. Cause I think what happens a lot in, um, modern life, especially when we take on like a physical challenge, we know we're going to be able to do it. Right. It's like, if you're running a marathon, you're not going, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to finish. You're going, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to finish in, you know, insert some random time goal. Right. So what tends to happen is if, if someone chooses something that is really at that 50, 50 mark is you're going to hit some points along the way where you think you're done. Like you, you have to quit. Right. Um, but if you can keep going past that point, then you can re have this moment where you look back and go, well, wait a minute. I thought I was like totally spent back there, but I've, you know, gone past that point. And then that leads to the more important question, which is like, well, where else in my life am I selling myself short? Yeah. Right. That's kind of like the moment you, this, the point of doing a Masogi is not to do a Masogi. The point is that you get a lesson about yourself from it. You realize that you undersell your, uh, your potential often like chronically do this all the time. And it's also a good fear check too. Right. Because, you know, in, in the past humans used to have to do these crazy outdoor challenges all the time. This could be from like hunting, um, from moving or, you know, moving your family to a different location or whatever. And this wasn't, we didn't have safety nets, right. And failure could mean death. So we evolved to basically fear failure of all kinds, yeah. but it's like nowadays failure is not death, right? Failure is like, oh, I misspoke on a podcast or I got a bad look from my boss or I screwed <laughs> up a slide or like I was late to pick up a kid, whatever it might be, but we still fear those things like it's death. And so I think that if you can put yourself in a position where you're really sort of dancing on the edge of failure, it kind of helps you reframe things and be like, Oh, you know, it's not so bad. So when we go back into your normal life, it's like, things are a little easier. Yeah. And it's not, and it's not necessarily a bad thing if you ultimately fail at the Masogi. Either, no. Right. right. So. Because I think you're still going to get to a point where you'll probably have gone a little farther than you thought. And in, in reality, if it's a 50, 50 shot, you should fail half of these. Right. So if you do it once a year and you're like 10 for 10, like, no, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. Right. Well, it's funny because I, I talk a lot about, um, so I ran my first marathon in 2007 and I followed, you know, Hal Higdon's couch to marathon to the T, you know, and mm -hmm. everyone kept saying, 
you've done everything. Once you get there, the marathon is just the, that's just the prize for all the training you put in. And I ran the marathon. It was terrible. I had a torn meniscus. It, you know, there was no prize in that. I finished. I didn't feel good about it. Um, and then in, I'm trying to think 2019, I guess it was, um, I did a, the marathon, um, w- during COVID. Right. And so I had signed up and I was like, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not training for this. This is stupid. I got to run it on my own. And up until like the week before I was like, I don't know if I'm going to do this. Like, and, and I started to like talk myself into like, this is dumb. You have not trained at all. You are in no shape to run a marathon. But I got up to that day and I was like, I'm running it by my, well, I was running it with a, a couple girlfriends, but I'm like, I have no one to account for. Like, let's just see what I can do. And I ended up running 22 miles. Um, and then literally I thought my hips were going to break off. I thought my hips were going to break off at about 11 miles, but I did say like, I'm just going to keep going. Right. Like, just, like I have nothing else. I can lie in bed. We're in, we're in the middle of a pandemic. I can lie in bed from and work for two weeks right now. So, um, I understood that, uh, conceptually when, when you were talking about this, but I also wonder too, can a Masogi be outside of a, uh, purely physical, so some of the things that I look back on in my life that were really transformational were, you know, I went to um, Guatemala and I was terrified. I went, lived in for, for 10 days with a group of people um, in the jungle there and we rebuilt a house. Um, you know, we were living on, uh, we were living underneath tarps. It was, it was very rough conditions. One, I did not think I was going to be ready for. And one that I had massive anxiety leading up to. But when I came back from that, I felt like a different person because I was like, I literally just spent 10 days in a third world country in some pretty dangerous situations where they had to stick us in school buses and get us, you know, get us to our location quickly. So we weren't taken for ransom and, you know, being exposed, half the people on the trip got like Montezuma's revenge. It was, you know, and you were just waiting for that shoe to fall that it would be you. And we were hard labor 12 hours a day. And I didn't necessarily think I was going to fail, but I also going into it, didn't think that I was going to, you know, there were times where I'm like, "Eh, I don't know if I'm going to do this. And at the end coming out of that, I felt like I could conquer the world. I'm like, I could go anywhere. I can do anything. So uh, do you think there's some some theory to that, that Misogi doesn't have to be like purely a physical feat? And if it does, I think talk a little bit about, you know, you're talking about this guy doing some pretty crazy things. Misogi is whatever is a challenge for you, right? Correct, yeah. Um, yeah, to answer your question, I do think that it can kind of be these things that just arise in our life. And I think really the, the underlying thing is that you're confronting fear and danger in the face. Right. And so to, to sort of also answer your question about it being individualized is that, yes, what is 50, 50 for you? Right. So for example, I had a woman, uh, email me. And the email just said, subject line Masogi. And I said, hello, my name is Deborah. I'm 79 years old. I read your book. I plan on doing a Masogi. I will make it hard. I won't die. Signed off, Deborah. <laughs> right? I love that. So Deborah's probably not doing an underwater water rock thing, right? But- Deborah's maybe doing like a five mile hike. Sure. But if Deborah only thinks she can do two miles, well, that's a Masogi right there, yeah. right? And I think also part of what it needs to be is there, it's like, what do you, like, what genuinely kind of makes you afraid? There's that Joseph Campbell line that's like, um, the cave you fear the most holds the treasure you seek. So it's like, I know because of my work, I know plenty of people who could go run a hundred miles, like just, you know, and be like all badass about it online, but like they couldn't sit in a room with their own thoughts for 10 minutes. Yeah. Right. So what's the thing that you're like, that you suck at, (laughs) that freaks you out? That's what you should be doing. Yes. 
Yes. Um, another thing. So, so everybody go try a Masogi. And, you know, I always kind of come up with ideas of things that I want to do, but I'm very intentional about how am I not going to fail. And so when I look at it, I, I love exploring this idea of like, how can I find something that there is a 50% chance I'm going to fail at it? Like I've mm-hmm. never looked at it from that perspective. And I plan on trying to accomplish a Masogi in 2022. I just got to figure out what it is because I let my brain get ahead of me. Like I've got, okay, I'm going to do this. I, this is, this is the plan I need to follow for, you know, the rest of the year to accomplish it. So um, I'm going to think of something good and I'll, I'll, I'll let you know what that is, but awesome. another thing that, um, I loved in the section of the book is, uh, while you're out in the Arctic, you have not, uh, caught or shot any caribou and hunger starts to set in. And you talk about this idea that most of us have never really experienced what hunger is real hunger, um, like hurting hunger inside of us. And it, it's interesting because right now I'm on this journey where I'm, I've become very disciplined about, um, my health and I've done a ton of research into what is the best way to optimize where I want to be. And for me, I want to get stronger. I want to drop 10 pounds. Like those are my two goals. And so get stronger. I know I'm, I just got to lift hard weights. I am a, I'm a person that just goes out and runs or rocks. So I I know how to do that, but I'm like, I just need to lift hard weights. That's how I'm going to get stronger. Um, get leaner. I had to figure out like, what is the best quote unquote diet for me? And after, and I've done everything uh, uh, over the past 20 years, you know, I, I latched onto Atkins when Atkins first was a big craze when I was in college and people were like, um, I got so skinny. People were like, you need to eat. And I was literally eating like cheese and pepperoni in my dorm room for dinner. Um, but so I know ways to lose weight, but you also gain it back. Right. And so as I started like researching, I found that like, it's a pretty simple science to weight loss. It's being in a caloric deficit. Like if you're in a caloric deficit, you will lose weight. It doesn't matter. I could eat one piece of cake a day and, or two pieces of cake. And if that stays under my caloric deficit, I'm still going to lose weight. I probably won't be internally as healthy as if I'm eating, but like, that's how you lose weight. And so I have been told by my husband over the past like six weeks that he's like, you're becoming a little obsessive because I've got my food scale. And so, you know, everything I'm putting on my plate, I'm portioning out because yeah, I'm eating steak and, uh, and vegetables. But what I realized when the first few weeks when nothing was happening and I was eating more protein and leaner, uh, leaner meats and vegetables, I'm like, I'm not dropping any weight. Well, then I come to find, well, you're eating a thousand calories worth of skirt steak at dinner. Like, yeah, that's not why that's why. So long story short, you start to explore this idea of hunger and diet, and you meet with this fascinating guy, Kashi, and he validated literally everything that I've been doing. And I I was reading it to my husband last night. I'm like, you need to sit down because everything you're saying about me is wrong. And he actually said, um, he actually said, uh, don't you think, Somebody said, don't you think that it is like kind of crazy to measure everything? And he said, you know, kind of thinks it's crazy. Is it abnormal to weigh and track every ounce of food? And he replied with a shrug, I was born a scientist. I started gathering data through measuring because I was used to running experiments. That's what you do when you're trying to learn something. It never occurred to me that people would think it's odd, but consider this, everyone measures their food somehow. How else would you determine a portion? They just do it subconsciously without precision. Okay, many people find it odd to measure things. Many people are also sick, fat, poor, slow, and ignorant as a result of non-measurement. I mean, I wanted to tear this picture out and like put it up on my fridge. And I love I love that guy. He's just he's just like savage with his intellect and can just pick apart people's thoughts and logic. And it's just, yeah, he's a good dude. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, you 
you interview him and 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 he's clearly a genius. I mean, it, he, he had his like PhD by the time he was in his early 20s, right? And mm-hmm. he's clearly a genius, but the science of what he's saying is so simple. I think we as a society overcomplicate everything. It's like, it's this easy measurement of what goes in, right? And just knowing what you're putting in your body, regardless of what it is. And I love how you open up the conversation. You're like, with him, your first interview, you're like, so let's talk about processed foods. And you thought it was like, he was going to be like, processed foods are terrible. And he's like, what's wrong with processed foods? You know? Yeah, totally. Um, Yeah, I love that guy. And I think, you know, to your to your point, it really does come down to, um, you know, all diets work if you follow them, yet most people fail. So yeah. it's like, well, why the hell aren't you following them? <laughs> right. And it usually comes down to uh, people start to get hungry on them because at the end of the day, you just, you have to eat fewer calories uh, than you're burning. That's what it comes down to. And so I think, you know, to your point about the measuring, what people don't realize is that especially once you start to lose weight, like you're, you're naturally going to try and eat more food. Like this is a body's, your body has all these defense mechanisms to try and keep you from losing weight. Cause for all of time, losing weight was like a very dangerous thing, right? right? You wanted to keep weight on. And so by measuring, it's like, you look at the research and people have no idea how much food they eat. Like you take a lean person, even a lean person, they will underestimate or they'll overestimate how much they eat by 300 calories a day. Take an overweight person, it becomes more in the 700 range, right? So really it's just a lack of knowledge about what a portion is and how much calories we actually need. So the food scale can be useful, even if you just use it for two weeks, because you learn things like, oh, what I thought was a regular serving of skirt steak, like you did, is actually like a thousand calories worth. It's like four servings, right? <laughs> so you extrapolate that over the course of the day. And it's like, well, no wonder people have trouble losing weight. And yeah. no wonder we're, you know, 70 some odd percent of the country is overweight. It's because our food is a lot more calorie dense now. We eat more of it. We have more opportunities to eat. And we have no freaking clue how much we're eating. It's like, I'm shocked that like 100% of us aren't overweight, to be honest. Yeah, well, um, you know, and, and getting back to how you dove into this, like this idea that like when you were in the Arctic, you really experienced what true hunger is, right? And you oh, were totally. rationing out protein bars and your MREs at night. And you were like, I can't eat more because if we don't catch this caribou, like this is what I'm living off of the rest of the time here. But getting back to that being uncomfortable, like if, if you're trying to lose weight, you're going to be hungry. You can't, you know, and I think a lot of, there, there are, there are dietitians that say you should never be hungry. Like you shouldn't, you should never be hungry. So if you're hungry, you're not, you're not doing this right. And so again, setting up for what you're trying to achieve by knowing you're going into it and it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable. Like that mindset is how you have to approach things and weight loss, weight loss being one of them. Of course you can take it to the extreme where it becomes unhealthy, but you need a certain level of discomfort to, to achieve what you're trying to achieve. Totally. Yeah. You're, you're going to be hungry. And it's like, I think we as a society think that like feeling some hunger is an emergency, like our head's going to explode. Like it's going to build and build and build until we literally just like disintegrate. It's like, no, (laughs) comes and goes in waves. You're going to be fine. You're safe. You're going to eat. Eventually you're going to have enough food. Like I talked to a woman uh, for the book who had worked with uh, Trevor and she was, I mean, she was literally morbidly obese, had diabetes, was like on the course to basically, she was going to die eventually, you know, and she tried everything, but a huge part of her was for her was learning that like, it's okay to be hungry sometimes. You know, and now she's like, she couldn't even, she could hardly even walk. And now she like goes out and she hikes, she does all this crazy badass stuff. Like, but she had to be able to accept that discomfort and realize like, yeah, I'm not going to die. You know, like it's fine. Yeah. You know? Well, I laughed about, I I laughed about your, um, your, you, you know, you ended up dropping 10 pounds by just recognizing what you were eating. And for lunch, you were eating a protein shake and a big scoop of peanut butter, which ended up being like triple the portion that you thought it was. And, Mm -hmm. you know, then you end up losing 10 pounds. Um, And I always laugh because Jason McCarthy, our mutual friend, 
he's like infamous for he 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 rocks and then he throws up like a pound of peanut butter on a piece of toast and he posts it and the first time he did it i texted him i'm like that's disgusting like that's literally <laughs> disgusting well it's hilarious because like the dude in my observations of him at first i was like i mean he's he's lean you yeah. know but i'm like this dude like doesn't eat at all I'm like, I can't, I'm shocked. He's not like, you know, even thinner. And then he posts those photos. I'm like, Oh, well, no wonder, you know, cause he <laughs> says all I eat is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then you look at it and you're like, dude, that's got, that's like the caloric equivalent of like five Big Macs. Yeah. No wonder you eat one meal a day. Cause the one you eat has like 2,500 calories and peanut butter. Yeah. Well, so you're, but God bless him for it. I mean, it's an amazing feat. I'm, I'm proud of him for his. I mean, I don't know. Habits. Yeah. I don't know how he, <laughs> he digests all that peanut butter. So, um, uh, so you're in the Arctic and your goal is the ultimate goal is to find a caribou. And, you know, you, you guys see these herds once or twice. Um, you miss, uh, you miss some opportunities. And also in this caribou hunt, um, and I'm not a hunter, but one of the things you talk about in the book is like, you can't just spot a herd of caribous and say, all right, let's go shoot one. Like there is a respectful way that you're doing this. You're not going to kill a young caribou. You're looking for an older, um, mature caribou that's towards the end of its life. And you come to, um, you come to a time where you guys track this herd of caribou. You see this one that's an older male that's limping. And it's like, that's the one. And the way you describe it in your book, where you're up there and you're the one that's taking that shot. Like I could feel everything you were feeling in the way you described it. It was pretty incredible. And you, you killed the, the caribou um, and you get to it and you guys uh, um, are William and Donnie are kind of taking the lead on um, cutting the caribou up and, you know, everything they were breaking down when they were talking about everything and like this is this type of meat and this is what we do with this and we're leaving the rib cage cracked open so the ravens can get to it and i mean it was it was super fascinating and you and you talk a lot about like what hunting is and what hunting represents in society and i had such a newfound respect for the sport of hunting when done in the way that you guys did it it was it was pretty fascinating but what it leads to is after that caribou hunt, you guys have to take all of that meat and take it back to your camp. And yeah. that struggle, like, let, let's talk about what that was. We've got a big rucking community that listens to this podcast. So uh, I, I ruck myself and I was like, this is the ultimate go ruck challenge that, that you experience in the Arctic that no one will ever get to experience. So, so talk to us about that and what that moment from killing that caribou to getting everything back to camp, what that was like for you. Yeah. I mean, so after I shot the caribou, I mean, I was a mess. Like I was totally emotionally like broken up, yeah. you know? Um, but then after we started field dressing it, which is like, you know, taking it apart for its meat or whatever. Um, my mind definitely shifted because I had this moment where I was like, oh, this is meat. It's like, you eat meat every single day, dude. And never once do you feel, you know, an ounce of emotion. Yet here you are right now, right? So it was kind of a, like a, an interesting realization for me that I think really changed my views on food and the life cycle and all these different things. But yeah, then we have to carry the thing back to camp. So we each probably had 110 ish pounds, I, I would say in our packs of, of this meat. And I had like the, I had its head in the back with these like antlers bursting out of my pack. It was like pretty epic scene, but we were about five miles from camp, which doesn't seem like a crazy um, distance, uh, but the catch was that it was all uphill and the tundra is like literally the worst thing you could ever walk on. It's like, it's half frozen. There's these big things called tundra tussocks all over it, which are like kind of partially inflated basketballs everywhere uh, made out of grass. And so you can almost think about it as walking uphill on really loose beach sand for five miles with 110 pounds on your back. I mean, that's what it was like. And it was, um, it's definitely the hardest thing I've ever done. And, you know, I've had to 
it's not like I'm a professional athlete or something, you know, but like writing for men's health, you get thrown into some weird situations at gyms where they make you do stuff. That's just God awful. But this was like the hardest thing ever. Right. But what it made me think about is, you know, I was aware of the fact that like the human body, um, it seems to have evolved to, uh, be a distance runner. So the reason that we can walk on two legs, why we are really efficient at cooling ourselves, why we don't have fur, all these other things um, are so we could do what was called persistence hunting as we evolved. So we would um, spot an animal and we'd start to slowly but surely run it down. And the animal would sprint away. Other animals are much faster than us. They're better at like everything athletic, okay? But they're not good at cooling themselves. So on hot days, we'd run, we'd bump it. We'd just keep kind of pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. Eventually after like 15 miles, the animal would topple over from heat exhaustion. And then we'd spear it and then we'd have dinner. Uh, but then what would we have to do? We'd have to do what I was doing, right? We'd have to carry the thing. And so as I'm carrying this uh, caribou, um, you know, going through physical hell, it kind of occurs to me like, well, that probably was an influential in how we're built and how we evolved too, right? And so I, when I got back from the Arctic, I traveled to Harvard and I met with a guy whose name is Daniel Lieberman. And he is the guy who made that discovery about how the human body is really well adapted for um, endurance, slowly but surely running. Um, we're the only animal that can really do that. But I brought up the carrying thing with him too. And he was like, yeah, we're actually studying that right now. Like we are, we are also the only animal that can carry heavy weight over distance, like literally the only one. I mean, obviously people will be like, well, donkeys can do that. It's like, well, yeah, but we have to strap the weight to them. They can't do it themselves. Right. <laughs> um, and then he sort of went on to say, like, I think that the activities that we evolved to do as humans are probably uniquely good for us. And those two things are, you know, jogging basically and carrying. And then in my mind, I'm like, well, a lot of people jog, that's good. But like, who the hell carries weight for distance, you know? And I was like, oh, wait, I know who does that. And it tends to be soldiers, right? Like rucking is the foundation of military fitness. And it has always been. And I was like, well, who's, who's doing a lot of rucking? I'm like, oh, I know Jason McCarthy. And go rock, right? So then I traveled down there and there's a whole section in the book about, you know, hanging out with him and just talking about rucking. Um, and I also get into just like how powerful exercise is for health. Like it is the healthiest thing you can do. The two healthiest things you can do are to keep a normal BMI and to exercise regularly. And I make the argument that rucking is the optimal form of exercise. And I will freaking die on this hill um, because you're not only working your cardiovascular system, which is really important, but you're also working your muscle. So what tends to happen is when people only run, you lose muscle. We know that muscle is really important for longevity, for mobility, for all these different health markers. Um, but at the same time, when you have people who are really focused on muscle and they're just, they're only lifting, they tend to not have great cardiovascular systems. That's equally important. So rucking allows you to hit two for one. It's a twofer. I don't know why people don't do it more, but I'm glad that your audience does. So I'm help. I'm trying to change that and you're helping. No, I, I you know, I, I talked to Jason a lot about, so I, I met Jason four years ago, you know, our, my organization has a partnership with go rock and, and Jason came to Georgia. We, we were doing, um, a, uh, summit with our, our Spartan members, we call them. And, Jason came down, we were going to film a little video and I had never, I mean, my brother was Marine. My dad was Marine. I've seen them with big backpacks on. I, I know what rucking is. I never thought about, and frankly, I knew about the go ruck community and I was just like, this is kind of weird. They're all walking around with backpacks on, you know? And, uh, Jason shows up and he hands me a rucksack and he's like, let's go for a ruck. And I, I, admitted it many times there was nothing in the rucksack. I think there was probably a bunch of like blown up plastic, but we just, we walked around. I mean, his had weight in it. Mine did not. We walked around, um, this lake and he just for an hour talked to me about the benefits of rucking and really said everything that you did. But one of the things for me that I loved about this idea of rucking 
was that there was this community aspect to it because physical exercise a lot of times can be very much done in solitude, right? It's a solitary um, experience where if I'm running, I can I can run with you next to me, but I'm not gonna have a conversation with you. We're just running. When I ran the marathon the first time, I, I did not, I didn't, there was no talking. I ran with my aunt, but I had my earphones in and, you know, I was not having conversation. Um, when I'm doing a hit workout or lifting weights, like I'm not, I'm very focused on what I'm doing with rucking. It's like, you can not only hit your cardiovascular health, but your strength. And you can also create relationships and create that sense of community and relationships that are also vitally important to your mental health. So totally. I don't, I don't think it's a two for, I think it's a three for, you know? And yeah. so I fell in love with it right there. I ended up, um, from that walk around the lake with really just wearing a backpack with nothing in it, ended up rocking the Marine Corps marathon and crossed the finish line with Jason, uh, I think a year and a half later. And since then, you know, I don't care if I'm taking my dog out for a walk or, you know, walking around the neighborhood with my son, my, my rucksack sits on the chair in my kitchen. And it's just like, I grab it and go. And it's yeah. become just like part of like, if I'm going to grab my jacket, I'm grabbing my rucksack, like it's, or my sneakers and my rucksack, like that's what I go out with. So I am, I am a diehard true believer. I've never done any of the extreme go ruck challenges, but I love that Jason talks about like, that's not what it's about. Like you can, maybe, I, maybe that's my misogi. Maybe I go out and do like a, a go ruck heavy or something, but you know, the idea of rucking is literally anyone can do it. Any yeah. single person can do it. And totally. Yeah. I love that. Uh, like, I just love that it's so scalable. Cause like, I'll do it with my wife. She's like, so my wife is just, you know, I worked at mental health for a bunch of years. Like I'm into fitness stuff. Right. <laughs> and she's just like, Oh, give me a break with all this shit, you know? Yeah. But she read the rucking chapter and was like, yeah, I think I'm going to buy a ruck from go rock. It's like, Rad. And that's the thing we do now, right? It's like when we walk our dogs, it's like, she'll wear a ruck. I got a ruck. We obviously have different weights in them, but it's like, we're getting the same effect because it's just so easy. And it's also like, to your point, it's such a good way to connect with people. You know, I think that, um, I mean, I think that social element has really what's been the secret sauce for CrossFit, but I think that rucking has this added benefit of that. You're going to be outside. We know being outside is like so good for people. And also, there's more time to talk, right? Sometimes with CrossFit, you're just like, yeah. you know, breathing in and out. But um, yeah, yeah, and 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 that's another thing when you talk when you do this um your section on exercise and you talk about exercise like and you're you're very clear to say like exercise is important no matter what, but mm-hmm. all, all optimal physical exercise sh- should be done outside. And yeah, I know, think so really getting outside. And that's something that, um, I actually was just talking to Jason about this recently. Um, I live in the Northeast. Uh, you'll catch me outside exercising from like April to November. Like if I can be outside, I want to, but I don't like the cold and I live in the Northeast and, but I had to like overcome that a little bit. And I really focused on that this year. Um, so much so that I was, I was telling Jason just recently, you know, it, it snowed a few weeks ago here and it was freezing cold. And, you know, normally when the temperature drops and if there's any sort of precipitation, I'm turning to my husband, I'm like, take the dogs out, you know, and I'm downstairs on our treadmill. And that day there was just something clicked in me and I'm, and he's like, I'm taking the dogs for a walk. And he has this like two mile loop that he does. And it was still snowing. I mean, it was actively snowing. I'm sitting, Travis hadn't given up his phone yet. So he's sitting on the couch on his phone. And I'm like, I'm going to go with you. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I I just, I got to get outside. I'm like, Trav, let's go on a snow adventure. I put on my snow pants, put on my hat. You know, I got all warmed up, put on my snow boots and I grabbed my rucksack. And I was so re-energized for the rest of that day. It's like, I mean, you hear the saying nature's medicine, but like going down on the treadmill would have never had the same effect that going outside for that hour did. Um, Oh yeah. A hundred percent. It's like uh, people spend like 95% of their time inside now. 
And we know that nature has like all that, like all these crazy benefits for not only mental health, but even physical health, yeah. Mark, like they've done studies, like people who are at a, in a hospital room, um, if they have a window that looks out onto nature, they have better health outcomes than people who don't have that window. I mean, it's, it's crazy. There's all these things. And I think we're spending more and more time inside and it's really too bad, especially kids, you know? Um, so yeah. And there's also, the physical benefit of like, if you compare people who are walking on a treadmill versus like a trail, there's a lot more calorie burn. It's, you're also working your muscles differently and then probably an arguably better way. So yeah, all exercise is great. Do any exercise, but I am saying that probably rucking outdoors is like a pretty, it's a pretty optimal way to exercise. Yeah, totally. So, um, I, I, I could talk to you all day because, and again, I'm going to see you down at Sandlot. You'll be at the yeah. Sandlot Festival um, in Jacksonville um, where we'll, we'll, we'll get to link up with Jason again. And, um, but one of the things I want to close on is like, I, I, I read this book and, and the one question I thought as I was going to talk through everything with you, if I was listening to this podcast, to this episode, I would, I would, be asking the question like, well, what would you say to encourage someone to get out of their comfort zone right now? Like, how do you start that work? You got to do something, right? I think sometimes we can get way in our head. I mean, take me with like my, my uh, drinking, right? It's like, I knew I needed to quit and do something, but it's like, I had all these like, oh, well, what will I do at a party? What will I do at my college reunion? What do I do? What do I do if someone, if someone asked me if I want to drink? Well, it turns out the answer to that question is no, thanks. You just, that's all you say, yeah. right? It's so much simpler. And I think that what happens when you actually start, you realize that it's really not that bad, yeah. <laughs> right? Like it never is as bad as people like think it's going to be. We have all, we have million years of human evolution basically telling us don't do the thing that is going to be hard. Once you actually do the thing that's going to be hard, it's like, it's not that bad. And you come out on the other side of that a lot better. I mean, you think of like something like when you exercise, it's like, what is really happening that makes it hard? It's like, oh, it's just like your legs are kind of whatever. Like if you can just observe those feelings rather than put like a negative or positive valence on them, like just things become easy. It's like, you just got to do something. Just got to do it. Yeah. And, and, you know, so this is called the resilient life podcast. I talk a lot about resiliency in the book that I wrote and when I'm out speaking and, you know, there, there's, and, and you talk about it in your book too. I mean, there's such a huge link with being resilient and stepping out of your comfort zone. Like you can only grow as a person if you step outside of your comfort zone, if you are put in those situations. Um, what, do you think, this is the question I ask everybody, the last question of each episode, what do you think living a resilient life looks like for you? Uh, that's a good question. I would say for me, it's having perspective and um, being grateful, uh, realizing just, I mean, like part of what I learned on this uh, trip and writing this book and through the experiences in my life is that, um, we, I, I would say the average person today, because the world has, um, you know, we just made so much progress. Like it is an unbelievable time to be alive, right? Like it's unbelievable. And yet um, the human brain, I write about this in my book, the human brain um, tends to look for problems, right? And the reality is, is that like things are really good. <laughs> and if I forget that, like, I'm not going to be as grateful. Um, I'm going to be more focused on myself. And so like, I guess resilience for me is one, having the perspective that like things are great in the grand scheme of life for me. Right. And then the other is like, okay, now that I know that, like, how can I help other people? And I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what came to mind. <laughs> it did. And everybody has their own answer to that. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I cannot recommend this book anymore. Um, I, literally, this book will sit on my bedside after I give it to my husband, which I told him when I finished it last night. I was like, okay, you're up. 
like read this. <laughs> I and, love it. Um, but please pick up a copy of this book. We'll have a link on our YouTube episode um, where you can uh, go and purchase this. We'll put links up um, when when uh, when you see it on our social media. And you can also join Michael and myself at the Sandlot Festival in Jacksonville coming up in April. Um, you hear me talk about a lot about that in the last couple episodes, but that's going to be a great experience where um, a lot of different thought leaders are going to be there. There'll be a lot of um, Misogi uh, challenges there for, for people as well. Um, and um, just diving into this, it was all stuff that, you know, I, I looked back at my posts uh, on social media and I have some posts about like the, com I actually did a post like two months ago about the comfort zone and what the comfort zone represents to me, you know, and, um, and reading this just reaffirmed so many things, but also made me realize, and there's so much that there's so many, you can see so many pages that I, um, that's awesome that I linked down that, uh, that I clicked down that we didn't even get to talk about, like, uh, your experience with the, the Buddhists was something I wanted to talk about, but we're running short on time. But anyway, pick up a copy of this book and you, you will not regret it. Uh, Michael, thanks for joining us. And thank you to everyone for joining us for another episode of the Resilient Life Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. That was super fun. I hope to see everybody in Jacksonville. Yeah. <laughs>